In case it's escaped your notice, there's been a heightened sense of awareness in our society on the issue of homosexuality. And if you were to ask me why this is, why is, this society, why is our society so focused on this issue, and other issues connected to this issue, uh, well, it just seems that everywhere you look, uh, people are um, talking about um, homosexuality. It, it's almost inescapable. We're even talking about it in church today. And so let me tell you why we're going to talk about homosexuality and related issues in church today. First, LGBTQ issues are very prominent subjects these days. It's a part of the world we live in, whether we like it or not. And I would remind you, if you are a Christian, that uh, you uh, do not live of the world, but you certainly do live in it. You see, if we choose as Christians to remain purposefully ignorant of how society is changing, then society can just simply ignore us. And we will fail to be as effective as we could be in presenting the good news of Jesus Christ to people. The Apostle Paul showed us the right way to connect cultural and societal issues with the gospel of Jesus Christ when he went to the city of Athens and he was brought to the Areopagus to explain his teaching. And on the way there, he had noticed something in town. He noticed that there was an altar that had an inscription on it. And the inscription said, to the unknown God. There are so many different gods that people worshipped in that city. They wanted to make sure they didn't leave anyone out. And so they wanted to worship the unknown God too. And so Paul noticed this going on in society. And he used it as a way to connect that society with the gospel. He connected their incomplete beliefs with the good news of Jesus Christ. And we today need to be well equipped to engage people in dialogue about the issues that they care about. The second reason we're going to talk about uh, in, in church today, talk about the LGBTQ uh, movement and same-sex attraction is because this movement has been very effective in becoming a part of numerous segments of our society. So effective, in fact, that your life has been affected by this movement to one degree or another. I'll give you some examples. In the realm of entertainment, uh, Hulu TV, which is a video streaming service, um, has dozens of TV shows that they categorize as LGBTQ. In fact, 13 of them are categorized as LGBTQ for kids, including a number of cartoons. In the realm of education, two years ago, a video web series was developed, and I'm going to quote the description from the creator. This was created, quote, to explain the issues and language of the LGBTQ community in a way that is accessible for preschool age children. The stated goal is to get these videos and others like them into public preschool and pre-K classes. Why? The unstated goal is that children are malleable, young children especially, and they simply believe what they're told. In the realm of government, already the LGBTQ movement has gotten the government to redefine the government's definition of marriage to include same-sex couples, and now there's a continued push to make sexual orientation a civil, a, a civil right on the same level as one's ethnicity. In the realm of church, there are a growing number of churches today that actively promote LGBTQ issues and philosophical positions. Now, the reason that I'm simply pointing out the LGBTQ movement as a whole is to show you that they have been, or that it has been very effective in becoming a part of every part of society. My focus today, however, is not going to be on the movement as a whole, but rather to look at the issue of homosexuality and others related to it as it affects you and your family and your extended family personally. The reality is that the biggest impact 
that the LGBTQ movement has had on us is not in the realm or the arena of education or entertainment or civics or the church, but rather on an institution that is far more critical than any of these, the home. A number of our extended families here in this church have been personally affected by issues relating to homosexuality or have someone who is dealing with same-sex attraction or have someone who actively practices a form of homosexuality and those extended families include my own. There may be, in fact, some people here today in this building or watching on video who are themselves wrestling with same-sex attraction or they're actively participating, practicing, if you will, a form of homosexuality. So let me be clear about this one thing. If that's you, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad that you're participating in this discussion today. And I hope that you'll hear the perspective that I bring, and I hope that you'll sense the spirit in which I try to bring this perspective as one of humility and compassion and honesty. And so reason number one we're talking about this today is because it's a very prominent subject. Number two, it's so prominent that it affects you to one degree or another. And reason number three, and this is the most important, God himself has spoken about this in his word, the Bible. Now, as I've stated previously, I believe with good reason that what the Bible says about a subject is what God says about it. And I've chosen to try to live my life according to the Bible. And so even if you disagree with me, about the nature of the Bible, in this message, if you'll listen, you'll discover not only what evangelical Christians typically believe about these issues, but also why we believe that way. Now, just because I believe that the perspective that I'm going to share with you is the perspective of God, not that I speak for God, I don't, I simply tell you what God has spoken in his word, that doesn't mean that I'm closing off discussion on the matter. What I mean by that is this. If you disagree with some of the things that I have to say, I'd love to hear from you. I'd like to hear from you on this matter. If you have any questions that you'd like for me to answer, probably on a future date, text me at 806-375-4240. These might be questions that you yourself are dealing with, or maybe questions that uh, you're concerned about someone in your family, or maybe they're just theological questions about these issues. I will keep your identity private when I answer these questions publicly on a future date. So, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? Years ago, I received an email from a church member with essentially that question. He wrote, I was watching an interview with a Catholic priest this weekend, and he stated that the Bible, or maybe the New Testament, does not condemn homosexuality anywhere, that this is a term that was not around in biblical times, and its usage is by those translating from the original text. My reply uh, to this church member was, the priest you saw in the interview was wrong. My guess is that he's simply repeating what he's heard, and maybe he just wants to justify his own beliefs instead of, instead of letting God's Word speak for itself. And then I gave an ever so brief survey of what the Bible actually says about homosexuality. And so today, let's just start with the biblical story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Here's the Reader's Digest version. Some angels believe, uh, visited a believer named Lot, but those angels you know, simply appeared to be regular men. And the men of Sodom uh, wanted Lot to toss those visitors out of his house so that they could sexually assault them. Lot refused and protected the angels, as if these angels needed any protecting. And in the end, the angels destroyed the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. What's the lesson here? Well, many Christians say, well, 
God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of the rampant homosexuality there. But others will argue, no. The real reason, the real crime, was the attempted sexual assault. The story just simply doesn't involve two consenting adults. And so my verdict would be, okay, you know, for the sake of argument, let's say that the real crime was the viciousness of the attempted assault, not the nature of the sexual act. Okay, so I'll, I'll, we'll pass over that for now, and we'll move on to something else, because there are other passages that deal with this more explicitly and more to the point. And one of those is in Leviticus chap, chapter 18. Leviticus 18 is a chapter that focuses on God's expectations for His people Israel in the realm of sexual relations. In verse 22 of Leviticus 18 says, You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. Now, very clearly, God is calling homosexual acts an abomination. That sounds serious. What does that mean? The word abomination means something that is loathsome, something that is utterly detestable. In the Bible, we have numerous examples of things that God says are loathsome and utterly detestable, abominations. For example, God says that certain practices that are derived from the worship of false gods are abominations. Like what? Oh, like burning your child alive as a sacrifice. Now, this would be unheard of for us today and good for us. But in Israel's day back then, that's one of the practices that their neighbors engaged in. These foreign nations that surrounded Israel. And God told Israel in the strongest possible terms, do not engage in what you see them doing. That is an abomination. Likewise, these foreign nations practice magic and divination in the worship of false gods, but God said that too is an abomination. If you make a sacrifice to God, but you do it with the wrong spirit, God says that too is an abomination. What would that be? That would be like someone uh, making a, giving an offering to God, but he's really doing it to be seen by other people. God knows that doesn't fly with him. That is an abomination. If you do business with your neighbor in such a way that you cheat them purposefully, God says that is an abomination. We don't treat others that way. That person you're cheating is made in the image of God. You might as well be cheating God himself. You don't do that. That is an abomination. And practicing homosexuality is an abomination. God detests it. But why? I mean, the LGBTQ movement says that those acts are acts of love. I mean, there's even a bumper sticker with the rainbow. It says, love is love. I mean, isn't God down with homosexual love? Well, no. No, he's not. And here's why. Here's why God opposes homosexual actions. Even those actions that the people themselves believe that may be performed out of love. You need to understand something about the nature of love. God created love. He is love, the Bible says. It is God's nature to love. And because love, even the love that we have for one another, is an expression of God's nature, it is God and God alone who determines the composition and the boundaries and the legitimacy of true love. If we say something is loving because it seems to be loving, or it feels loving, or because it has a certain effect 
on our spirit or even on our bodies. Yet God says that that experience is a counterfeit to true love or, or that it falls short of true love. Then God's opinion, not ours, wins the day. He is, in fact, God. We are not. Let me explain something else about the nature of love. The New Testament, as you might know, was written in the language of Greek, and and this language had a very magnificent way of describing every aspect of love. And the Greek language used four different types of words to describe love. And God created humans in such a way that there is only one relationship that we can have in which every one of these types of love can be expressed fully without diminishing the others. The first type of love I'd like to talk about is phileo love. It's brotherly love. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, right? This is the love of companions or friends. You know, the love that you have for friends, it can be very intense, very deep. The Bible says there is a friend that is closer than a brother. And that's true. Maybe you have a close friend like that. If you do, cherish that because that is very rare. You're not going to have that close, intense phileo love with scores of people, probably not even a handful. But we're talking about a BFF. We're talking about someone that's close to your heart, a brotherly love, a love of companions that they have for one another. But you know, phileo love, the love of friends, it has boundaries. For example, the love of friends is not sexual. Once friends become sexual partners, The whole relationship changes. The phileo love, at that point, has been diminished. And it has begun to be replaced by a different kind of love. It is no longer purely the love of friends. You see, there is only one relationship where we can experience true phileo love after It has crossed into a sexual relationship, and that relationship is marriage. If two males who are close friends become sexually intimate with one another, or two females who are close friends do the same, or if two unmarried close friends of the opposite sex become sexually intimate, they have crossed the point, they've crossed the boundary of phileo love, and their phileo love will be lessened. It has become a different type of love. And the second Greek word is eros. Eros is sexual love. We get the word erotic from it. It's sexual love. Sexual love is very special, and it too is a gift from God. True sexual love is more than simply sexual activity. True sexual love, as God designed it, is a physical union of a man and a woman that fulfills the spiritual union that they have. Now, sexual love has boundaries too. Since God created sex, it is God who sets those boundaries. For example, it is God's desire for physical intimacy to remain in the realm of marriage. And one of the reasons for this is because sexual acts with another person strip away all the layers of your spiritual heart that protect your vulnerabilities. Sexual acts expose the deepest and most intimate part of your spiritual heart, and that is a place spiritually that you want to protect yourself from against others who might harm you. In other words, only the most trusted person 
should have access to the deepest and most intimate part of your heart. You should only want someone who is committed to you for life to have access to that part of your heart, to every part of your heart. And there is only one relationship where we can experience true eros love to its fulfillment, and that is marriage. Someone might say, well, hey, why can't, you know, can't homosexuals, can't they have deep trust in one another? Well, sure, of course. Of course they can. But that's not the only component at play. Homosexual acts violate another one of the boundaries of eros, sexual love, that God has designed, and that is the boundary of male-female. God designed eros, sexual love, to occur between a male and a female. Not between two males and not between two females. How do we know this? There's at least three reasons. First, God says so very clearly in his word. In Genesis chapter 2, in verse 18, here's what we read. Then the Lord God said, and this is when Adam was all alone, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and every beast of the field. But for Adam... There was not found a helper suitable for him. So, once the Lord got Adam's attention that he was all alone, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. There's a second reason why God designed sexual love to only occur between a male and a female, and it's simply this. The way men's and women's bodies are physically designed and the way they function is a clear indication of God's intention And I'm not going to get into a graphic discussion of this very obvious truth. Parents and queasy Baptists, you can thank me later. Third, the end result of sexual love, as God designed it, is the continuation of the existence of humanity itself. Children. You see, homosexual relationships do not produce children, cannot produce children, and never will produce children. They are an end in themselves. Now, sure, a homosexual couple might want to adopt a child, but I would remind you that that child was created by a heterosexual couple. And sure, there might come a day when a physician can stick you with a needle and obtain stem cells from your spine and clone a child without the need of a heterosexual union. But if you ask me, that's a pretty hard selling point. I think that most people would prefer the old-fashioned way of producing children. It's usually more fun than having your spine stuck with a needle. You see, Homosexual acts are not a true expression of eros as God designed it. 
True eros has the potential for, in its fulfillment of producing children, where the husband and the wife both love without condition a third member of their family that has been produced by the eros itself that exists between the two. Homosexual acts cannot do that. And if, indeed, true eros, as God designed it, produces a child, then that eros has also produced the next type of love. Storge love is the next Greek word. Storge. This is the natural love that protects. Most often, storge love is the protective love of parents toward a child. Storge love, that protective love, just like phileo love and just like eros love, can be very intense. For example, a 120-pound woman can whip a 240-pound man if she thinks her children are threatened. You don't want to mess with Mama Bear. She has a storehouse of storge love within her. Mama Bear love is a type of intense love that is a gift from God. It is natural. It does not have to be taught. It simply exists. But true storge love also has boundaries. You see, God designed children to need the protective, the storge love of both a father and a mother, of both a male and a female. When a father and mother both have storge love toward a child, that child has everything. That child has provision and protection and safety and nurture and tenderness and compassion and righteousness. That child has everything. Joseph and Mary, Jesus' earthly parents, provided storge love to Jesus. And as a result, the scripture says in Luke 2.52 that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with people. Now, of course, we know that not every child is blessed to have both his, both his father and mother to raise him. Sometimes a parent will die, or the marriage will fall apart, or something else will go wrong. And this leaves something missing in the heart of the child. Homosexual relationships not only fail to produce children, but homosexual relationships has the lack of the adults of both sexes that keeps those children in the household from, and it keeps those children in the household from experiencing storge love, at least to the extent that God designed it. There's only one type of relationship where we can experience true storge love in its fulfillment, and it is marriage. Marriage is the only type of relationship that can give us phileo love, the love of friends, without corruption, while giving us eros, sexual love, as God designed between husband and wife, with the potential of producing storge, protective love, of the man and the woman toward their child. And the relationship of marriage itself is, of course, an expression of the greatest type of love, which is Agape love. Agape love is God's love. It is the love that sacrifices. It is love without conditions. And someone might say, well, wait a second. Can't a homosexual love, or can a homosexual person love with a sacrificial love? I mean, can't a homosexual person love without conditions? And the answer is, of course they can. Of course they can. The ability to love sacrificially and without conditions is a gift that God gives all humans because all humans are made in His image. However, a homosexual couple, or for, or for that matter, an unmarried heterosexual couple, cannot leave their phileo 
their love of friends unaffected after engaging in sexual acts, it has forever changed. And a homosexual couple or an unmarried heterosexual couple cannot have true eros, sexual love, as God designed, whereby producing, excuse me, whereby the lifelong spiritual union to keep them only to one another sexually and to them alone, and with that possibility of that union producing a third or a fourth or a fifth member of that family. And each successive member of that family is literally a part of the man and the woman that created it. Homosexual partners cannot do that. And a homosexual couple or an unmarried heterosexual couple cannot have true storge love. They cannot have true protective love as God designed. Whereby they have committed to always and forever provide for, protect, and love their kids and one another as a family. With the husband bringing all of the gifts of manhood into that family. And the mother, the wife, bringing all the gifts of womanhood into the family. In every homosexual couple, there is missing the gifts provided by either the man or the woman into that family. The marriage relationship is the only way for us to experience all forms of love as God designed, from brotherly to sexual to protective to God's love. According to the Bible, marriage is a covenant of companionship between one man and one woman for life, resulting in a spiritual and physical union that often produces children. The only sexual expression that God both created and approves of is found within those boundaries. Someone might say, well, Hey, what about the New Testament? I mean, didn't Jesus sort of give implicit acceptance of homosexuality since he never spoke against homosexuality? Well, no. Jesus spoke against any kind of sexual behavior that exists outside of the bounds of marriage. For example, one of the evils that Jesus spoke against is Mark chapter 7. In Mark chapter 7, verse 21 is, he used the term, sexual immoralities. This means any type of sexual activity outside of the boundaries of biblical marriage, and that, of course, includes homosexual activities. In Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we read the Apostle Paul's words. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. Why? For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural, and in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman, and burn in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. Now that's a pretty strong condemnation. But someone might ask, you know, why is the Apostle Paul picking on homosexuality? You know, if all of these other heterosexual practices that are outside the boundaries of marriage are also sins. And certainly they are. And that's a great question. Here's the answer. You're absolutely right. That heterosexual activity outside of marriage is sinful. In another passage, Paul says exactly that. But notice in Romans 1, the words used to describe homosexual acts. He uses the word unnatural. Unnatural. Homosexual acts go against God's natural order. The idea of a man and woman engaging in physical intimacy, even if that man and that woman were not to be married and were to be outside the realm of marriage, even that act itself is at least an act that occurs in the way that God designed those bodies. Some people confuse physical pleasure with God's endorsement. They say, oh, it feels so good, God must be for it. But listen, regardless of how much physical pleasure might occur, homosexual actions go against nature and should be avoided. And if they are not, those who engage in them receive in their own bodies the penalty of their ways. And someone might say, well, but you know what? Homosexual acts sort of, they feel natural to me, or they might say, I was born this way. To me, it doesn't matter if someone believes they're born homosexual or if those homosexual tendencies were learned. Why? 
Because it is the act, the homosexual act, that God condemns, not the temptation. Jesus was tempted in three ways. Desires for his eyes, desires for his flesh, and the desire to become boastful and prideful. These were very real temptations that Jesus experienced, and to every one of them, Jesus said no. He refused to engage. I was born heterosexual, and I learned to be heterosexual. Both genetics and environment made me the way that I am. And yet there is a physical boundary that I do not cross. I'm 51 years old, and there's one woman that I've been with. The late Christian apologist Ravi Zacharias put it this way, Every man who is an able-bodied man here can tell you that temptation stalks you every single day. Does it have anything to do with your love for your spouse? Probably not because you can love your spouse with a 100% desire to love the person, but the human body reacts to the sight entertained by the imagination and gives you all kinds of false hints that stolen waters are going to be sweeter. They are not. They leave you emptier. So a disposition or proclivity does not justify expressing that disposition or proclivity that goes across the board for all sexuality. Sometimes people are turned off to Christianity because it is claimed that we discriminate against homosexuals. The common term is homophobia. That, that accusation was once leveled against Ravi Zacharias. The person said to him very clearly and succinctly, what turns me away from Christianity is that you people will talk against racism an awful lot, and I respect that, but when it comes to to an homosexual, you discriminate against the homosexual. That's a double standard. Part of his reply was this. The reason we are against racism is because a person's race is sacred. One's ethnicity is sacred. You cannot violate it. My race is sacred. Your race is is sacred, and I dare not violate it. The reason we react against the issue of homosexuality the way we do is because sexuality is sacred too. You cannot violate it. My question to you is, how do you treat race as sacred and desacralize sexuality? Sex is a special, sacred gift of God. He said, I can no longer justify an aberration of it in somebody else's life. Then I can justify my proclivities to go beyond my marital boundaries. That is why God condemns homosexuality in both the Old and the New Testaments. Both in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10... In 1 Timothy 1, verses 9 and 10, Paul lists homosexuals among those who have misplaced desires and will, unless they repent, receive God's judgment. Now listen, he is not talking about homosexuals who were formerly homosexual, who have turned away from their sin and now follow Christ. He is not talking about Christians who fight against the temptations of, of homosexuality, yet above all else, seek to follow Christ. The homosexual who will receive God's judgment is the person who outright rejects what God says, is determined to do as he or she pleases, and embraces their disobedience to God as a lifestyle they willingly and purposefully choose. And there is something I want you to hear very clearly. Christians do not believe that some people go to hell because they are homosexual. No. People don't go to hell because they engage in any type of sexual sin. People go to hell because they refuse to believe in and follow Jesus. The sexual sin of any kind is simply 
a result of unbelief. And that is not to say that Christians never fall in this area. That is not to say that Christians cannot engage in sexual sin, whether it's heterosexual or even homosexual sin. But when a Christian engages in sexual sin, the Holy Spirit convicts them about the wrongness of the act, and the Holy Spirit draws them to confess it to God and turn away from it. If you are a Christian and you practice homosexual sins or you practice heterosexual sins, God calls you to stop it. For that matter, if you are a Christian and you actively participate in any type of sin without repentance, God calls you to repentance. So, how should we, God's people, the church, relate to people who are homosexual? Here's how. We treat them with respect as we treat anyone and everyone who is made in God's image. We must accept people the way that they are, just as Christ accepted us the way that we were. We must love humanity, all humans, the way they are right now. And we need to keep in mind that the way people are right now is not the way that they may be if they begin to follow God. Also, I want you to hear this very clearly, church. Acceptance of people does not mean endorsement of behaviors. Sometimes I behave in ways that I do not endorse. But I accept myself, if for no other reason than the sake of sanity. I wouldn't know what to do if I didn't accept myself. We have to do that. And so we have to accept others, too, even if we do not endorse their behavior. You know, I don't know of anyone whose beliefs or behaviors would cause me to not be able to sit down with them and treat them with respect and have an honest dialogue. I think that I can sit down and have an open, honest dialogue with someone who believes the very opposite that I do about this or any subject. And they might tell me why they think I'm wrong, and I might tell them why I think the Bible is right. We must remember that Jesus died on the cross for every person represented in the LGBTQ com community or alphabet, not just heterosexuals. All sexual sin is loathsome and detestable to God, yet God can and wants to forgive it. Question. If we treat people with respect and we welcome them to church to hear the gospel, does that mean that practicing unrepentant homosexuals can become members of this church or even leaders of this church? The answer is no. No one that actively and knowingly practices any sin without repentance can become a member of this church. Every one of us might stumble and fall, myself included. But when we do, we turn back to the Lord. To be a member of our church, you do not have to be perfect. None of us are. But you cannot be dismissive of God's commands. You can't just live a completely unrepentant life and join this church as if it were some type of club. There must be a real faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that causes you to repent of your sins, whatever they may be. And by the way, nobody in this church cares what your sins are, what they were. We really don't. We're glad that you're following Jesus now. Okay? Here's the bottom line when it comes to our sexuality. God has given 
every person that you and I encounter a sacred gift. And he's given this gift to you too. It is the gift of choice. You can choose to live your life God's way. Or you can choose to live your life another way. You determine your life. But I'd warn you. And I warn you with humility in my heart. Not as someone who is better than you. Not as someone who judges you. I do not. I warn you because I don't want to see happen to you what might happen. My warning is this. If you choose to disregard God's way, and you choose to live your life that God is clearly con- in such a way that God is clearly condemned, there is something that you cannot determine at that point. You cannot determine the outcome of that choice. You can make a choice, but you can't determine the outcome of it. You cannot determine the consequences of the choices that you make. Those are set by God, and God has spoken clearly. So be warned of the danger of not following God's ways. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, the issues of homosexuality and same-sex attraction and all those related to it are very complex, very prominent. So, Father, I thank you that you've spoken clearly in these verses and others to let us know where your heart is on the issue. Father, I pray that you might help us as Christians to be loving and accepting, to be kind and gracious, to not be fearful of our neighbor, and certainly not to be repulsed. But Father, let us engage our neighbor in discussion that's honoring to you. Let us present the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the best of our ability with everybody. Father, remind us that it is not our purpose as a church to change people's sexuality or their choices, but rather it is our goal as a church to present Jesus and help people follow Jesus and let his spirit handle the rest. Father, I thank you that you have forgiven me. You have forgiven every true believer in this room and every true believer watching on video of all of their sins, of all of their past. And you've given us a new life in Christ. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song of response. And uh, as you sing this song... Consider your place before God. He loves you. Jesus died for you. And I want you to know that if you consider yourself somebody that you think you've gone too far, you think that God can't forgive you, you think that God detests you because you've committed some type of sin that you have difficulty forgiving yourself of, I want you to know God's grace is greater. God's forgiveness extends further than you could ever imagine. He will not turn you away if you come to him in repentance and faith. But you do it. He's only a prayer way.